sustain our this venue so we gratefully accept their donation for the community i would like to thank julie boyer from comcast and dan vasquez our volunteer camera operator who's donating his time this evening i'd also like to mention jackie misa and mike kirby for their time spent leafleting the surrounding neighborhoods as well i'd like to thank the other members of the paradise city forum advisory committee for helping to plan this evening's programming uh, Comcast has asked from the members of the audience when you decide to speak or if you decide to speak that you would turn so that the camera can uh, uh, get your face. Mm -hmm. I'd now like to introduce our panel. We have Annalise Sponza, urban planning doctoral student at the University of Massachusetts and currently a legislative assistant for Massachusetts State Representative Benjamin Swan. Mr. Swan is the Vice Chair for the Committee on Bonding, Capital Expenditure, and State Assets. Annalise has also served as guest moderator for the forum on four occasions last year. Joseph Kopchinski is an Assistant Professor of Architecture and Design at the University of Massachusetts. He is the Principal of Studio Projects, an interdisciplinary design studio focusing on the links between design, culture, and art through public and private design commissions, installations, and research. He's also a 12-year resident of West Street in Northampton. Naomi Gray Chase is a Smith College alumna, president of her alumni class, and co-founder of the Student Alumna Alumni Coalition for Responsible Expansion and Development, SACRED. She has lived in Northampton for most of the last 16 years. Joel Russell lives on Kensington Avenue, and has a regional and national practice as a land use planning consultant and attorney. He has been active in the campaign to reform state land use law in Massachusetts, including attempts to modify the Dover Amendment, which exempts educational uses from most zoning restrictions. We also have Mayor Claire Higgins, who needs no introduction, and also Ruth Constantine from Smith College. I believe she is the Vice President of Finance at Smith College. And finally, our guest moderator, Erica Gies, member of the American Institute of Architects, past president of the Western Massachusetts American Institute of Architects, local support for the SDAT as president of the local chapter, and also past member of the Design Review Board of Amherst. Please join me in giving all these folks I mentioned a rousing round of applause. regarding the Educational Use Overlay District as proposed, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, considering the need for bulk and height restrictions, which is something that uh, a lot of us have, have talked about, but I'm going to do it in an illustrative way and, and use the current Smith College engineering building as a case study to talk about issues of, of bulk and height restrictions in the Educational Use Overlay District. So these, uh, these are my seven concerns. This, this came out of a letter that I wrote to the planning board uh, when, they are, when they were reviewing the Educational Use Overlay District. And uh, I'm going to go through them very quickly because I really just want to focus on um, the two points that I mentioned. Uh, one is the bulk and height issues. And uh, the second point that I didn't mention yet was um, how does this Educational Use Overlay District support previous planning studies? And I'm going to uh, take a look at the West Street planning uh, charrette that happened uh, last June to also kind of talk about how 
that information has not been applied to the issues of the district that is proposed. So um, the, the, these various issues, I'm just going to go through them very quickly, does not provide for any neighborhood preservation. This comes from uh, efforts made by TAN, the Coalition for Affordable Northampton Neighborhoods, to talk about preservation, neighborhood preservation, as a part of any expansion that, that Smith would be planning. So not, it's not, uh, the TAN has never been proposed to Smith expansion, but the idea is that how, how can you creatively expand uh, the campus on its edges and still be respectful to the communities that exist on those edges. Uh, the education solar does, does not align or support previous planning study. We'll talk a little bit about that with the West Street uh, uh, planning study, but previous studies have always talked about the importance of neighborhoods in downtown Northampton and how those are uh, important to the economy, to the life of Northampton as we know it. And then um, that the district will have a significant impact and should be part of a comprehensive planning process. So many people have talked about this overlay district is happening very too quickly. I mean, why can't it be part of a more comprehensive planning process? Um, the, the fourth issue is eliminating reasonable regulation. Uh, I think Joel is going to talk about a little about the, the Dover Amendment. And one of the few uh, things that Dover can do is control bulk and height restrictions. And in a sense, by not having them part of the education social aid district, we lose an important opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to act in those ways to control uh, the kinds of construction that are going to happen within, within North Hampton. And then uh, undermines the public review process, I think, because part of this is that uh, the, the building heights and the various things that are proposed will be now become as of right. So the, the review process is no longer uh, something that we can really discuss because Smith will be allowed to build 55 foot buildings and up to 85 feet buildings, 30 foot back from the setback. Um, the closing of Green Street and the loss of neighborhood business district. And, uh, you know, that's also a, a, we feel an important point. And then the, uh, one of the key topics is the concession to Smith College in replacement housing. And, but, but Smith has agreed to do the replacement housing. This is something that the trustees voted on many years ago, and perhaps the, 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 uh, the participants in Smith we can talk about that. Okay, so this just gives you a sense of, this is the current uh, map that's being proposed for the Education Use Overlay District, and uh, you know, its primary reason, which is really kind of said here in the second sentence, is intended to allow for orderly expansion of education use with a clear set of reasonable, dimensional, and density standards. So the question is, does this district, as it's proposed, really represent reasonable dimensional and density standards. And, and I, I would argue that. Uh, one way of looking at that, this is uh, both text and an image from the West Street planning process. This was completed in June of 2005 by Goody Clancy. And it had uh, that report, and, I, and, and uh, I don't mean to just summarize the report in one slide. The report was complex and talked about the issue in terms of the community needs, Smith College's needs, the city's position. So it's a very complex document, but it did, in some ways, talk about planning directions, address some principal issues. So town down edge that reflects a permeable and mixed use condition, uh, buildings that are oriented to the street, alternative siting options for the Smith Engineering and Science Complex were actually you know, that part of the planning directions here, you know, and the commercial clusters, and uh, preserving a permanent residential enclave. Uh, so that's one idea that we've talked about. Of course, the so then commit to definitive long-term strategies, no loss of housing and affordable protection. That has actually been done by both the city and Smith. But it's that first part about the uh, kind of preserving. Of course, there's an or there, so you can pick one or the other, and the, the city has decided to uh, do the latter. But I want to also just show you the, the diagram here, which is scenario four. There were four scenarios presented. The one, the first one, that was presented was basically what we're getting with education solar district, Smith taking over the whole area. Uh, this fourth one was one that was, in, in my experience of being at the Charette, very, that the, the people at the Charette, the community members, are very responsive to this particular scenario. Right? And it shows a kind of mixed reviews along West Street and you know, a pos and, uh, uh, the campus uses set back from West Street. Now, if you look at the, the overlay district, there's really, it's, it's just the, the whole neighborhood is just taken over with the uh, Smith um, zoning regulations. And none of the complexity and subtlety of this particular proposal is in the education resolution. 
So why is there a need for healthy bike uh, bulk restrictions within the UO? Uh, and the, I'm going to look at the case study for Smith College Engineering Building. Here's a plan. Uh, I don't know how clear these images are, but uh, it's a plan of the building, the, the outline of it, and you can see the community that's around it. Now this is an image of the bulk of that building relative to the buildings that are around it. This is the image that we produced at Pan. To kind of really show that no one had actually done a drawing with this to show the size of that building relative to the community that's around it. So we're talking about a very, this building is 140,000 square feet. It is twice the size of the student center. Okay, so that would be a good comparison. You know how big the student center is? Put the times that by two and you have this, uh, this building. And how tall is it? I beg your pardon? How tall is it? Ah, good question. How tall is a 55 foot building? That is the question that we're going to ask tonight. Now, what, how tall is a 55 foot building? This is a view of, what, of uh, Green Street, and uh, you can see John's establishment right there, the Green Street Cafe, in all its glory. And the building next to it is the engineering building. And uh, so, one of the things that you can note here is that the building was filed at 53 feet. So you can see where that is on this draw, on this illustration. It's, uh, the building was filed at 53 feet. Has, oh, that's right here. That's the parapet of the lowest part of the building. After that, there are these larger roofs that go up uh, to 79 feet. The average height is 67 feet. We argued in a, in a uh, appeal to this that it should have been counted at the 67 feet. It was a gable building in Northampton. We filed for the zoning. Should, it's the medium height between the top of it, the top of the gable, and the bottom of it. So we argued that it should have been filed at 67 feet. But, okay. So that didn't happen, and uh, the uh, and it was because there were mechanical systems within that building. So, but the mechanical system typically takes up a small percentage of the rooftop. This takes up pretty much the whole length of it. This building is 300 feet long, but 100 feet wide. So it's about the size of a football field. Okay. So what does this mean? Bel this is Belmont Avenue currently. So you can see the, the site of the uh, the bookstore. And the three buildings on the right are the, the buildings that are going to be destroyed. Now we're slowly, slowly ghosting in the Smith building. Can you see it there on the image? Yeah. Is it clear? Yeah. Maybe it'll be clearer now. Yeah. So the comparison between what exists now and what's proposed is pretty, pretty clearly demonstrated within these images. And this is why there is a great need for an education overlay. A view from Arnold Avenue with the Smith building in place from Belmont Avenue to the Smith Building in place. These are the porches of homes of people in my town. Thank you very much. Just read the section that's relevant. Um, 
It says, no zoning ordinance shall prohibit, regulate, or restrict the use of land or structures for educational purposes on land owned or leased by a nonprofit educational corporation. So its it, it first statement says, basically, zoning can't, even, can't affect um, educational institutions. Then it has an exception. It says, provided, however, that such land or structures may be subject to reasonable regulations, I like the word reasonable, concerning the bulk and height of structures and determining yard, yard sizes, lot area, setbacks, open space, parking, and building coverage requirements. So that's basically saying that if an educational institution owns property um, anywhere in the state, um, it can basically put whatever it wants there. Um, subject to reasonable regulations on height, setbacks, size and bulk, and, and uh, parking and that sort of thing. Um, and there's been a lot of court cases, there have been a lot of court cases on what is reasonable regulation. And um, I don't have time to go into that um, and if, if uh, you know, it comes up, we can talk about it. But um, so the city is really limited in its ability to review and control what, what a college does and, and therefore, um, in most communities, having a good relationship between the college and the community is, is really an important thing so that people can work together on, on solving problems. The uh, planning boards can do a very limited form of site plan review, which is a, uh, it's not like what the planning board can do when it's considering a business or a, a major uh, uh, shopping center or something. It's, it's limited to those issues I mentioned, height, setback, um, and bulk, and parking. Now, just briefly, there are a couple of other things that cities can do. Um, one of them is historic districts. We have the Elm Street Historic District, which um, made an attempt to control some of what happened with the student center. Which I think people are mixed feelings about the results of that. Um, there's also a central business district architecture district, which uh, exists downtown, and that could potentially be expanded to other, other areas. Those are not part of zoning, and so if it's not part of zoning, then the city can potentially have a, a more of a role. Um, I think in a nutshell, my, my analysis of what's happened here, and I'm, I'm really trying to um, play the role of, of getting us to work together on this, is that the Smith offered a number of things uh, to the city that the city has no legal ability to require them to do. Um, replacement of the affordable housing, payments in lieu of taxes for land they take off the tax rolls, relocation assistance to uh, people who live in the neighborhood and, and uh, commercial tenants uh, promised to maintain a certain amount of mixed use on West Street. Now what many of us wanted was maintaining the residential neighborhood that was there. And, you know, and, and I wish that had been able to be done too, but uh, that, that wasn't in, in the plan and that's a very hard thing to prevent under, under the state law. Um, so Smith essentially offered to do certain things that it didn't have to do. And I, you know, I'm, this is my understanding of it, but we have representatives from both and I stand to be corrected when they speak. Um, and the quid pro quo for that was, in other words, the city offered in return that they would uh, limit the amount of control over uh, some of the development Smith might do. So whereas they might have been able to have more effective control over bulk and height setbacks, um, because Smith was offering some of these things that weren't um, something the city could require, um, the city is easing up certain of, the, of those type regulations and making it possible for Smith to know where they stand. I think the problem for an educational institution is they know that they, they're not completely subject to zoning, but they don't know really how far they can go, and they don't really want to have to go to court to find out, which is ultimately um, that's what you have to do. So, um, Again, I, I, um, I know, no, I'm not purporting to speak for either Smith or the city on this. I'm just trying to uh, give my understanding as a land use planner and attorney of what I think is the framework uh, in which we're operating. And um, I think I'll leave it at that for now and um, let, the, let everybody else speak for themselves. Sure, I'm just going to go down. I'm Ruth Constantine, Vice President for Finance and Administration at Smith College. Um, I'm going to try to make a point of not repeating what Joseph and Joel have, have already said, but I do want to uh, 
um, reiterate some of the things you may have heard at the public hearings or read in the newspaper just to make sure that we have a common understanding about what I think are a few key points. Uh, first, I'd like to make sure that people understand the college itself um, is not growing in terms of student body size or faculty in any meaningful way. Uh, maybe 10 people over a period of a few years, that kind of thing. Um, however, we do have a very constrained campus uh, compared to other colleges like Smith. And uh, as a result, as you all know, um, we are growing uh, across Green Street in order to uh, make sure that we can maintain competitive facilities. One thing that we do know is that we do have to have uh, facilities that are competitive in order to attract top students and top faculty. So that's very important um, to the college's ongoing success, and I think that that um, also affects the success of Northampton since we're one of the um, two largest, two or three largest employers in town. Uh, currently, the campus of the college is falls into three different zones. Uh, most of the terms of those zones were um, not written with a college campus in mind. They pertain more to kind of commercial and residential uses. Um, the proposed zoning would consolidate this, of course, into a single zone, uh, as Joseph has already described. Um, I believe people know this, but we, the college would still need to seek site plan approval for um, new structures over 2,000 square feet in size. So there would still be a public hearing process, but as noted, um, some things would then be already defined, if you will, as right, as somebody said, um, as part of the, uh, the defined terms of the zone. Um, we have uh, Wayne Fiden from the planning office has distributed, the mayor is probably going to say this, but I'll just mention it, um, copies of what will um, a slightly revised um, description of the proposed zone that will be discussed thir at Thursday night's hearing. Uh, Daryl's passing out more copies of that now. And they formalize what you may have um, read in the newspaper already, which is a lower height limitation for the area that we call the quad that falls between Paradise and the Princeton. Um, I think the only other thing that I would like to um, note is that when the uh, city approached Smith during the um, prelude, the leading up to the site plan approval process last summer, when the city approached the college about the possibility of uh, a joint development agreement that would not only um, put in writing and, and a kind of a contractual form um, some of the things we had already uh, promised, but also extend those uh, across a few more areas and importantly extend that whole commitment over a 30 year period. Um, I feel confident that both of the parties cited the city and the college um, both felt um, that the that this is a fair and balanced agreement between the city and the college. Now, I know we have disagreement about that um, in the room, and I've heard some of that at um, the earlier uh, two hearings um, that were held in, in City Hall, but I think it is important that people understand that um, the college, in, in, and we haven't had the impression that the city felt this way either, that there was any sense of a power grab or a power play or um, a, a seeking of an imbalanced agreement between the two parties. Rather, um, it's, I think it seems clear to the two parties, the city and the college, that um, this is a fair agreement and that the college has made some commitments, as Joel already said, um, that it doesn't have to make, and in return the city too has made some agreements um, that it doesn't have to make, um, and we'll see if we're able to get those through the um, public hearing process. <laughs> um, hi, Claire Higgins, I'm the mayor, and I'm a other signatory to the development agreement. Uh, so I want to start with the process question. Um, uh, I'm happy for us to talk about this as long as we need to talk about it. Um, you know, we've been moving along for a long time on this. If we need to take longer, that's fine. So this question of closing the process down, I think, is pretty correct. Um, we actually started with an ad hoc working group of reports here that came out in a year ago, March, 
then there was a um, the, the, the charrette, the West Street charrette, which, which different people have different opinions of what happened there, but, but there was a public planning process there. And in that, the, I, I got up at that meeting saying that we were going to have to come out of that with some zoning um, advice for that area. And I also said that we had, during this process we were going to need to do a development agreement. We then did a development agreement signed by both the president of the college and myself that had to be brought back to our governing boards, our legislative bodies, if you want to call it that. The president needed to bring it back to the trustees. I need to bring it back to the planning board and the council. And that's where we are right now. We're still in that process. So I don't have the power to sign a development agreement that is the be all and end all. It still has to go through the legislative process and that's what's happening. And, and that's the way it should be. So given that, I want to go back now on a little bit of history, um, <clears throat> or a little bit of discussion about the thought process. Um, the, the college has been buying property in that neighborhood for, I would say, well over a decade. I might be wrong about that, but I think it's probably well over a decade. And I think there was, there was knowledge in that neighborhood, and I think throughout the city, that the college was buying that, those properties. Uh, because I lived in that neighborhood years ago, and the college came through my apartment. Now, they didn't buy that, <laughs> but I know that they were looking at in their properties in that neighborhood, and I think many people did for a long time. Um, and in fact, they have offices off Belmont Avenue and had had, had, had property down there for many years. Um, they uh, decided that they were going to expand, I think, a number of years ago, and, and then more recently shared that information with the city. We started first talking about housing, the trustees, uh, there was a group put together called SNAP, Smith and Northampton Affordability, project? Partnership. And um, working on the question about replacement housing and the trustees did commit to replacing all the housing that would be lost during this process. I don't believe in the, either Bruce or, or, um, or um, Fran can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe they can be used in a term of 99 years for affordability. That commitment came in the development agreement. It, it was a simple agreement to replace and then we built in the term in the development agreement. Um, the next set of, the, so that process happened, and then, then we went through the process that I just talked to you about. So then I went forward based on many of the, much of the data that came out of those processes, and we started meeting with the college around what we wanted in the development agreement. And clearly replacement housing was one of them. Um, payment in the taxes was one, and uh, payment for the lost taxes that came to the city of Northampton and the college did agree to that. That's the first time the college has agreed to that. The college will tell you when that, and I guess they're right, that they're the biggest taxpayers in the city of Northampton. Uh, the property that they own that's not directly used for college use. My point to them is always, and we've had this argument, I don't know how many times, but that, it, that um, if it's not in college use and somebody else lived in it, they'd be paying those taxes too, so that's really kind of an irrelevant statistic. But nevertheless, uh, they did agree to now pay us taxes. They agreed on a parking study, which we've been pushing them for many years to do, and they agreed to do that. Um, the other thing that they agreed to do um, was, there's a, a number of things on relocation of tenants, an uh, uh, absolute commitment on the, um, on the residential tenants and on a case-by-case -case basis with commercial tenants. Um, I want to get down to future building design. I mention was made in the Goody Clancy report. We exerted parts of the Goody Clancy report, especially as it, as it, to do, as it had to do with design and put it directly in the development agreement. And the college has signed on it. This development agreement has been filed with the site plan at, at, from the engineering bill. And it will be enforceable in court if the college decides not to follow through on it. So we did try to deal with some of the design issues. There's lots of things we weren't able to do. We weren't able to get Smith to not build. And I know that that's an issue for folks. But they have a right to buy property in our system and build on it. And uh, we can't stop them from doing that. Um, we weren't able to get them to buy property at the state hospital, which I hear from lots of folks. And they're not interested in doing that, and we can't make them do that. Um, we, um, it, it's a, I think it's a, an interesting point that it should have been done through the full comprehensive planning process to do this zone, except that we started this well before we even began the comprehensive planning process. And there's lots of other things that we began before then, too, that have to do with zoning that are still moving forward. We didn't stop all work as a part of the comprehensive planning process. Um, so 
I want to t touch on two other things. Uh, uh, Joel and I probably will have a good conversation with, about Dover, but I would say to you that um, under Dover, if the college wanted to build an 85-foot building and they could prove to us why they have the right to do that, why it's necessary for the program, they could build it under Dover. They have to prove that they need it. So um, that's why the building on Green Street can be the height that it is, and that's why the zoning board didn't rule in the neighborhood's favor. That's the way Dover's written. I, the city council of the city of Northampton signed on to the Zoning Reform Act because of our concerns about things like Dover, among others. But it hasn't passed yet, and uh, what's your best bet now? <laughs> well, uh, great question. Uh, and the Dover Amendment for I heard taken it, out of it. I just heard it was just jettisoned out of it. So it's really an issue for us, and we've been, we've been on board trying to make changes there, but it's not happening right now. I would like to touch on the historic district and the architecture district issue. Um, first of all, we have a historic district on Elm Street. Is it local? Or no? It's a local. 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 It's a local historic district. What it doesn't have and what it should have is design guidelines and teeth in those design guidelines, and it could have those. And it and it's something that could be done separate and apart from any discussion about this overlay. And as Joel said, it's exempt. It's not a zoning not a zoning ordinance, so you can do it. Ruth also knows how I feel about the um, campus center. Sure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think at the dedication I said the true test of whether or not this belongs in historic district would be in a hundred years. Because today, it's not particularly uh, fitting. <laughs> Nevertheless, the historic commi commission voted to approve that, and I think it's partly because they, hadn't, they didn't have the teeth or the Moxie, I'm not sure which, to go after it in, in terms of design. It's my strong suggestion to the planning board, and I've said this before, that the design guidelines be put into that. Secondly, I think on West Street, we should be expanding the Central Business Architecture District up into West Street in order to deal with design on that side of the campus. I think if you combine that with the design guidelines that we have in the development agreement, we can get not 100% to where we want to be, but much closer to where we want to be. I said finally probably three times, but I'm going to really say it this time. We did, um, we did um, hear, the, um, uh, hear the concerns that have been brought up relative to the Elm Street Kensington Avenue area. Wayne has um, worked with the college to come up with a, a, a modification in terms of the setbacks in those areas, and we hope that that will go some way to easing people's minds. But I think the biggest thing that would ease people's minds it would, is if we would really, as well as doing that, also deal with the design issues. That, that are uh, necessary to do in that. I'm really regretting my choice of uh, spring attire. <laughs> Evening, <laughs> bad call. A little optimistic. Um, well, I want to first thank you all for coming out tonight and thank the Sweet City Forum for giving us the opportunity and Daryl for all the work to, uh, to put it together. And I'm glad that I was able to participate. I don't have a field of expertise uh, that is quite like the rest of the people on the panel. Um, I'm sorry, could you introduce yourself? Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. I'm Naomi Gray Chase. I'm uh, the alumni class president of class of 94 at Smith College and also co-founder of SACRED, which is the Student Alumni Coalition for Responsible Expansion and Development. Um, I'm here tonight as a representative of SACRED. Um, we're a group of students and alumni who are concerned about the approach the college is taking to its expansion. We are not sanctioned by the college or the alumni association, and we do not speak for all students and alumni. The members of SACRED believe that what the college is currently endeavoring to build and the ways in which it has conducted the planning process represent a serious departure from the stated mission of the college and that the choices being made by the Christ administration go against the intention of the college's founder and against the wishes of a majority of students and alumni. We are dismayed by the ways in which the college has neglected to inform students and alumni about its true plans for long-term development in the Green Street area, and we are disturbed by the ways the member of, members of the neighborhood have been left out of the process. Many of our concerns are best addressed to the college itself, but in this public forum, we want to make it known that there is a determined and ever-growing movement among alumni and students 
who want to see our college do a better, more socially and environmentally responsible job of planning and expanding. Our topic of discussion this evening is sustaining community on the campus edge. We believe that in order for community to be sustained at the campus edge, the college must first acknowledge two things. First, that sustaining community is worthwhile. And second, that its campus does, in fact, have an edge. An edge that we believe should not continue to encroach without limit into the surrounding residential areas. As the college and the city move forward with plans to cope with Smith expansion, we would like to ask the college to do the following things. First, stop comparing this small, cozy, urban campus to larger, more rural campuses when crafting plans. For example, when, the, when justifying the current plans for 400,000 square feet of new science buildings, President Crist and other college representatives compare the Smith campus to campuses of academic peer institutions, most frequently Amherst and Mount Holyoke, each of which boasts the campus with roughly 1,000 more acres than Smith. We believe this is an inappropriate comparison and that it does not ethically further the process of decision making regarding land use. Second, stop abusing its privilege. Because the college has so many resources at its disposal, we believe that it bears a correspondingly large responsibility to its hometown and to its neighbors who do not have a billion dollars in resources or the protection of legislation like the Dover Amendment. Third, genuinely engage the community and actually listen to their input. They have waited too long to invite community members to the table. And the situation was exacerbated when the input provided by residents of the ad hoc working group and the Goody Clancy Charette were effectively ignored. Or, we would like the college to do a better job of using its existing resources before it plans any future expansion. And lastly, we would like the college to make a pledge to always consider the town of Northampton to be its equal when making decisions that affect the future of both the college and its hometown. Smith alumna Madeline Langell taught us that like and equal are not the same. The needs of Smith and its neighbors are not alike, but we believe that they are equal. Thank you. I have some information here from Bob Ritchie, uh, who says, uh, notes that the American Planning Association says that Massachusetts uh, is one of 28 states with the weakest and most outdated state land use laws in the country. Uh, and right now, as we speak, uh, there is a new planning reform act before the uh, legislature, the Community Planning Act. 
And the thing that I want to you know, keep before this audience is, again, how problematic zoning is, period. Not just uh, the Dover Amendment, but the uh, zoning as a whole and the educational uh, use uh, overlay district. And I, I, get, I have a concern about that because I think it can add another layer of regulation uh, that not only members of uh, CAN or Paradise City Forum or anyone else at this table would have to work through, but um, it, it would just add another layer of regulation, another layer of language uh, that often uh, loses community residents in the process. And that's my concern, and I wanted to just put it out there, you know, for consideration and kind of keep in mind the kind of work that is going to require to sift through uh, the language and also to understand what's, what's entailed. Also, you know, what, what the plan for demolition is going to be, what the plan for clearance and also for uh, completion is going to be under this development agreement. I think that's another issue. Because as you know, with many of the urban renewal projects in the United States of America, uh, they just wipe out land, but then those, that land stays vacant. As a matter of fact, uh, after the uh, Euclid v. Ambler case, uh, that land has been vacant since the 1970s. So I think that you know, when you're thinking about demolition, you're thinking about a new layer of regulation in the form of an educational use overlay district, please, please, please think about the way in which that is actually completed. And I think I'll end on that note. <laughs> So then, I want to thank all our speakers, and <coughs> I will be taking questions in one second. I just want to set the tone for this evening. What we'd like to do, we have this great panel here. Everybody's got a chance to speak. I want to give the audience a chance to speak, but I think it would be great if you could come away with here with some positive, constructive suggestions on kind of rebuilding the bridges between opposing groups and opposing visions here and, and try and find something that we can work on to move forward in a positive way. So I'd like to open up the floor to, I guess we saw a hand here. Maybe to be fair, I think to give everybody a chance to speak, let's start with one minute each for comments and give the panel an opportunity to respond. Does that seem fair to Let's start with that, okay? And maybe I, I saw this hand go first. Let's just go from this side over. It is um, five to eight. We are finishing at nine o'clock, and there are a lot of people in here. So one minute at least we have a chance to say something, and hopefully give the panel a chance to respond. But let's, I would like to just set the tone of, let's have something, a constructive conversation. This was the point of this um, forum, and I would like to do that. Okay. So. Having a question, I would just like to share that about, that about 7.30 this evening, the Northampton Historical Commission approved Smith Collins' application for the demolition of 16 Belmont Avenue, 20 Belmont Avenue, 22 Belmont Avenue, 22 Arnold Avenue, 78 Green Street, 88.
to stop at Route 9 or Elm Street, um, since that is a historic district, why does it have to cross Elm Street? Uh, well, the reason that, the, that we set back is because there was a hearing on the planning board, and the planning board, I think, was interested in saying that there's some other options that could be looked at around that area. Can, can you speak Elm, up, Claire? Sorry, please? I'm sorry. It crosses Elm Street where the college owns the property on both sides. So it doesn't cross where the college doesn't own the property. My understanding, Wayne's here, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is it crosses Elm Street where the college owns the property already. So the boundary around already owned property on that side. And then the planning board, um, I didn't say, I couldn't say for the whole hearing because I had another meeting, but my understanding was the planning board asked that the, the staff to go back and see what was possible, whether Smith would be willing to talk about changing the setback in that area, and that was the conversation. So my reference to three zones, that's, uh, there are three zones that apply to the campus now. This would just be a single zone. Uh, Wayne, help me out here. The three zones that cover the campus. Uh, neighborhood business, which is basically Green Street area. URB, which is our medium density zone, which is much the campus. And URC, which is actually kind of URB. So most of it's residential. Uh, that's why it's not a really great mix. We have done one other overlay. We've done a lot of overlays, but for the hospital we did an overlay for similar reasons because of the same kind of Dover issues. So we wanted to clarify what was allowed in the creative the hospital. Yeah. I, maybe we didn't understand the question. There are two questions. The question about the three areas within the overlay district itself and what was the process that those three districts were decided upon. Not about the three existing zoning districts within the I think I think there was initially one area which was the out which was in the original amendment and it had a setback of, of 30, 30 feet, well, 30, 60 foot so it was gonna and then 30 foot 55 and then 60 going up to 85 feet or 60 feet back. Um, so now it's essentially this as I understand it, it's a two. The area of the quad is, is now has the lower height limit, and the rest of the campus has the higher height limit. Now, well, I'd like to just pick up on a couple of comments made by panelists. I think that in a in a better world, a perfect world, a world without the Dover Amendment, um, in other states that doesn't have that kind of law, you would have an incentive to do what what does happen in some communities where the community and the college work together on a campus master plan that goes through a community discussion process and ultimately gets approved and then the college can do whatever is in that plan and if they want to come back and change it they can come back and have a public discussion um, and, and that's the kind of process that i think works best and has worked in other places um, the city can't make that happen um, but as the, uh, as the Smith alumna said, you know, Smith could agree to go through a process like that, and I think it would be a, a welcome change to that. Uh, yes, I, think, you know, I want to go back to that question again, and, then, because, and, I, and I made a, I've heard of a different way you know, in the question is that, the, so this is the first time we've seen the change to the overlay district that shows they are intending to have a lower height, and the question was, what about Elm Street area? You know, that, that still was actually under the, the 55 and 80 foot, 80 foot foot foot. No, it's that's backed up. Part. It's also backed up. Just for the first it's part next to Paradise. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, it goes all the way up to um, four buildings. Four buildings more before the, um, before the, uh, before the uh, college. Right. Okay. So it's backed up to where the president is. So this area here, uh, the, the, this part here, is that still subject to this 55 and 85 foot zone? It's backed up further. Yeah. How, how far is that? Six, uh, another 60 feet. 60. So it went from 30 feet to 60 feet. And then at 60 feet, you can, you can start going up one foot. And 85 foot zone. So it's not the same. This this district is a 45 foot limit around the entire the, the area. The residential and, area. So, so I think the question is that in that area north of, uh, of Elm Street, there are a lot of residential buildings there. There's also a scale of building there that's actually quite mm -hmm. low. So 
why wouldn't the same thinking of the 45 foot district in the same scenario be applied to the east north assumption? I'm sure the planning board is going to have that same discussion. Um, this was the conversation that we had with Smith, and this is where they're willing to go. And uh, I will say that um, there's a little drop off there, too, so the height changes because the Elm Street, the high point, you walk that a lot, you notice that it starts to drop off there. So the height from the street is a little different. It's a funny, it's not a huge drop off, but there's a small drop off. I understand all the potential benefits of the development agreement, especially in light of the Dover Amendment. Nevertheless, I'm still opposed to the education use overlay, um, in part because I think that the kind of litigation that we'd like to avoid and the kind of mutual symbiotic relationship we'd like to create could be created by uh, the creation of an ordinance known as a transfer of development rights ordinance a TDR, where you would basically say that Smith may have the right to build up to 85 feet on a case-by-case -case basis if appropriate in a particular area in exchange for payment to create open space or you know other things along those lines. You would therefore create an opportunity to be able to build those 85 foot buildings where appropriate, but you would be using you would be using your leverage to get payment for things like open space. So I am opposed to a, a blanket agreement that would allow them to build up to 85 feet without it being under um, a TDR zoning ordinance. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. I've heard you speak before about TDRs, and I'm actually very fond of the idea of TDRs. And we actually have a TDR on the book in the city of Northampton and identified a receiving zone. Um, and so a, rec a, a receiving zone at the state hospital, we haven't identified sending zones. And we hope that'll come out of the comprehensive planning process. I'm going to turn to the lawyer, but I think that this, that I don't think under, under Dover we have the right to do a TDR with SNP because it's still, it's still limiting your ability to build a building. And, and that's what what Dover doesn't allow us to do. And I, I mean, I'm, well, well, I think I mean, it's a creative well, idea. What, what I just don't think we can do it. <laughs> you put, I mean, maybe what you're suggesting is that as an alternative to having to litigate the 85 feet, um, you just give Smith the op option instead of writing the check to the lawyer, write the check to the city so they can buy open space. Yes. Um, <laughs> and um, of course, we we would like. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's a nice idea from the city's point of view. Um, <coughs> but I would just, the TDR um, is like a quid pro quo for, for, the, for the construction. You can look at everything in the development agreement and read what the quid pro quo was for the, for the zoning overlay. It's housing, it's not open space, it's not dollars to purchase open space, but it is affordable housing, it is a parking master plan, it's all those things that are in there. So I just wanted you to know that to the extent that a, a, a TDR tries hard to create some sort of a trade, um, that was certainly the intent of the development agreement. Open space didn't make it in, but a lot of other things. But I'm, not, I'm just, I mean, it's an interesting legal question that you bring up. I don't know, I mean, I, I don't know that we could do that. I don't think you could require it. I don't think right. that's what but I But it could be, um, I mean, you could put it on the menu. You, you could put it as an option that, uh, that you know, say the height is whatever it is, 45 feet, and then, you know, Smith has a choice of going to the city to get a grade, uh, if the city turns them down, or paying a fee. Um, but I, I do think that if we're talking about setting a tone of cooperative planning, then, you know, maybe that's not the best way to look at it. Uh, anyway, um, you know, it's a, but it is an interesting idea. My two points are, number one, that I don't think, I think it's potentially an excellent idea and has, does not appear to have been explored, and I think that's a downside. Number two, in terms of the quid pro quo, what it eliminates is a potential of the contention that we've been having here, so that if you could go back to the drawing table and renegotiate it under a TDR, you might eliminate some of the contention that you're having here right now. We are, as part of this process, I'm making note of different things that come up that then we can issue a document and, you know, there, it's on the table. I think it's good to make suggestions and we want to hear suggestions from all sides. This is creative 
process here that we're trying to encourage. So let's keep going through. I just want to see how many how many people want to speak because I want to keep the sense on the time. So let's see. All right. So we have another ten people. Okay. Let's still stick to our one minute. The point of information. <coughs> if an educational use overlay zone is created. Is it a single use zone? What do you mean by single use? Well, is it the way a residential zone is only a re is only residential? Is it it's a an overlay? So the but underlying zoning. So is, is Smith the act the, 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 the acquisition the acquisition land uh, and sold it? The underlying zoning would be in place. But when Smith uses this zone, can they only use it for educational purpose, or can they, within this zone, for, an, uh, for an, uh, what would be allowed as, a, as an educational use? But, so the, but the underlying zoning is still there. So for example, this does cover that Green and West it's, Street area, it, it, some of which is residential. Now. It explicitly says for educational use. But my question is this, is there anything in an educational use overlay zone that prohibits multi-use? I don't believe so. Let me, can I try to clarify that? An overlay zone is by definition um, a, a zoning category that sits on top of the existing zone. So whatever the existing zone is, if you are being you know, a high density residential, a medium density residential, all of those uses are still possible, are still allowed. It's just that really all this educational overlay does now is give them, is change some of these dimensional requirements dealing with height and setbacks. Um, what I tried to suggest is it could be a lot more creative than that, but that's all this proposal is doing, and it does not change the underlying zone. Then this is the point of my question. In what way can this overlay zone be used to encourage Smith to make more uses of this area, including commercial, residential, any other use besides just their own educational use. Can I answer? I mean, just in my opinion on it, I mean, it's just that. No, I think that's one of the problems with this education this overlay is that in a way, as an overlay district, it really does promote educational uses. So any kind of potential mixed use can happen because of the underlying uh, zoning and district, but there's nothing that the overlay district do, does to encourage it. Right. But, the, but the development agreement addresses, um, at minimum, it addresses the continuation of commercial presence in the pre-existing neighborhood business district. And I don't think anybody wants commercial presence on Elm Street unless I'm uh, reading this crowd only long. for 10 I, years, though. Right, I understand that, but it's interesting. Okay, I do. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you can have conversations with the other Elm Street neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay out of that. Okay, on this side behind you. I was just wondering um, if there's been a lot of contention so far, there's been a part of a lot of that contention for the past few years now. And as Joel had suggested, you know, there seems to be, although it's not part of the law, it's not mandatory, it seems like there could be a middle ground that could alleviate most, if not all, of that contention where there is sort of a cooperative process, um, where you go back to the table and talk about the different areas of what, you know, the overlay district, and that's the area that Smith is most interested in is to talk about each area in particular, the specific neighborhoods that have specific needs. And I would just like to know, um, since that is an obvious answer or solution to this, it has pretty much been, I think, in my opinion, been neglected to date, I would be really concerned, I would really be interested in talking about what are the roadblocks in place to what, what's stopping that from right now happening? I know the law, I know the Dover Amendment, stuff like that, but in terms of what Smith's needs are and Smith, all this, what, what are the real roadblocks whether that we're making that process not be able to happen? I, I, what I'd say is that I think the city's been trying to work within the legal framework that we've built, and I'm, I'm sure that there's criticisms of the process that can be made. But we're trying to deal with it. If Smith wanted to 
say that they're willing to put everything on the table. Certainly, we'd be willing to talk about it. But you know, they have a they have a, a legal framework which they're working in, and they're holding on to their prerogatives under that legal framework, and and that's their right to do. I, I appreciate yeah. you would do respond, but I would actually mention what the colleagues have to say. What the Scott can say, basically the, the balls in their court. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the ones that are, are basically passively deciding not to participate in that respect. So what are the roadblocks from Smith College's point of view that would could you know soften up and, and alleviate a lot of the contention that I think personally is going to continue to grow? Well, John, I don't know that the college has you know explicitly decided to refuse to divide up the campus into a lot of neighborhoods, but um, but I can say with great confidence that we're in three zones now, and the whole point of this is that we're looking to be in a single zone with a single set of guidelines. Now, given that, why would the college um, concede so quickly the area um, for, you know, concede to a lower height restriction for the area between um, Paradise Road and Kensington? Because that area was built in a certain way with a certain kind of architecture all at about the same period of time. And um, we don't, we can't imagine uh, doing anything, any new construction in that area over a very, very long period of time, other than perhaps, you know, small dining additions to, you know, very sensitive to the existing architecture, that kind of thing. Um, it, it, we, one can't say that from the college's point of view about the rest of the campus. The rest of the campus um, isn't, doesn't have four areas that were constructed pretty much at one point in time with a fairly common set of architecture where we, we can't imagine uh, anybody ever deciding to do something different with it. So we're really interested, as I say, the whole point of this request, this, this um, element of the um, development agreement was to achieve a, a single set of guidelines for the campus. I don't feel like my answer, my question was answered. I wanted, I was interested in the roadblocks to a creative, more of a creative approach. It's, it's more, you know, uh, an embrace of community needs and, and all this stuff, the stuff that we've been talking about here, the reason why we're here. You know, I understand you said about and you know, the new area, but. Well, maybe I misunderstood your point, but, um, but I thought that your prelude to that was um, talking about the campus in different areas and the unique needs or, or concerns in different areas. And so if that's the purpose, which I've always understood it to be based on the comments made in the two public hearings, um, that, that purpose is really contrary to the college's purpose in seeking a single time. I, I, I think what, what you're suggesting is that if you look, if you define the campus, if you look at it, it falls into different types of areas. You've got a core campus, which is all owned by Smith, which is all Smith buildings, which has most of the larger scale buildings, and where I think everybody agrees the larger scale buildings belong. And then you have a lot of buildings that are owned by Smith that have sort of filtered into the surrounding neighborhoods. They're more the smaller scale buildings. I think to Smith's credit, most of them have been kept and haven't been demolished, and they've been very well maintained. You know, those beautiful houses along Elm Street that have been reused for Smith purposes and on, on Bedford Terrace. I mean, I think everybody really appreciates how those have been taken care of. But they have a very different character from the main core of the campus. And I think the suggestion is being made because they have a different character and because they have a mixture of different uses and some people live there who aren't connected with Smith and some other places, why not treat them differently than the four campus in your campus planning process? And, and I think that's the wrong thing. And, and well, you don't have to yeah. do that legally, but I think we're, you're being asked, well, why not? Right, and um, in our campus planning process, sorry, did somebody not want me to respond? No, no, no. Oh, okay. In our, <laughs> thought I heard somebody speaking. Um, in our campus planning process, we do. We are very sensitive. I actually chair the college's campus planning committee, and um, and we're very sensitive to our different areas of campus and the existing architecture and size and scale 
in those areas. Um, we're not interested in turning that into a legal requirement for the college. We're interested in preserving that as um, the way the college plans its campus and not in converting that to a, a legal contract um, that we set today and that then rules all future planning. So we, would, we want to maintain that flexibility uh, that the college has to continue to take those things into account. Many of the areas um, are not of one type of architecture. So for example, there's a very large former laundry building um, of, across Elm Street that, became an, that be, uh, was annexed to the uh, college's campus school uh, in the 90s. Uh, very different in character than the smaller residential buildings nearby, but nevertheless, now uh, an, an old and cherished part of our campus. So we've tried very much to um, respect what's there. And so I think the question here is, um, kind of the, at the core, are we willing to kind of give up that flexibility and turn it into a kind of a legal <coughs> arrangement set in 2006? And the answer to that question would be no or not. Could I rephrase the question? <laughs> I don't think that's a good question for the candidates. I think the question is, are you willing to let the community into your thought process more, share your thought process with the community, and let it evolve jointly, not as a legal requirement set in stone in 2006 forever, but as an ongoing discussion that involves more communication. I, looking at how this all evolves, you know, I, I think um, the engineering building seemed like it came up very fast, at least for the community. I mean, you know, you were planning it, and, and I have a feeling that you must have thought it through at great length and done some sort of assessment to determine that that was the best site for the building. Um, but I don't know that that was ever shared with the community or discussed with the community, and then all of a sudden you're exercising your rights to do it. And I think we all understand that we have those rights, and what I think the community is asking for here is are you willing to not just stand on your rights, but say, well, let's work together. Am I, is that what you're getting at? I couldn't be more patient as a The mayor is holding in her hand the development agreement. Well, it does have information sharing. I mean, I, listen, if Smith was willing to have us as an equal partner at the planning process on this campus, I would love that. But I don't think that's what they're going to do. But Ruth can tell you that. I don't have to tell you that. But when we were able to get in the development agreement, it was that they agreed to notify the city in a complete and timely manner of any issues of planning directions that would have a significant impact on issues in this agreement, which is more than we've ever had from them in terms of information sharing. We, we, it's important for all of us to have that information, and we try to memorialize that in this agreement. And then what we do with the agreement information in terms of trying to pull public input in is something that we as a community have to discuss. But this is a threshold question for us around the information sharing, and we were able to get that in the development. Okay, I'm going to take one more question on this side. We'll go to the side, then we'll go back. So, uh, My question is really quick. Um, I understand that this is the first building of many that Smith's going to build. And um, I was wondering if all the buildings that Smith um, is going to build in the future are involved within this specific educational um, Let's see. The, we, I think what you're remembering is that um, when this conversation started, and this is still the case today, um, over, over some period of time, 20, 30 years, uh, Smith expects to, to build three or four science science and engineering buildings in that same area so that eventually this plant building would become interior to the campus, if you will, with the edge of the campus moving over to um, to West Street. It, it's all in that kind of upper part of that neighborhood. So all the future plans that Smith has will be included in this the, specific um, This The development agreement is a 30-year agreement, and what we've been very clear about is in that kind of a planning um, framework, this is the area that we expect to be growing in. We do not plan to, to grow the campus in any other direction in that kind of a planning framework. Now, the thing is that colleges, hopefully, last you know, three or four or 500 years, and I can't speak for the very long term, but um, you can certainly be confident that during the time frame of this agreement, this is where the college comes from. Okay. 
So my question is, somebody, either Smith or the city, the mayor's office, have put zoning, the issue of Smith zoning, on the table as part of an agreement. Good zoning, I think if you ask the, the planning office, if you ask any of the architects, if you ask any of the urban planners, will say good planning looks at all of the issues at the same time, simultaneously. Not saying we'll give you this and then we'll talk about these other things in the future. My point is that all of these things should be done simultaneously. If, if we're going to increase the height of the, the buildings, okay, talk about parking now, talk about historic district now, talk about a better site plan review. You don't want a site plan review for 2,000 square foot building for a 140,000 square foot science building. Talk about all of those things at the same time and make that part of your agreement rather than giving away everything and then saying, we'll talk about it later. Okay. Here, here. I get to respond now? Sure. Okay. There was a question. <laughs> I was looking for the question mark. But <laughs> First of all, I don't think we gave away everything. I think we got in this agreement as well. And I've already mentioned a number of times what we got, so I'm not going to run over to run through that again. But we did get 99 years of affordability on the housing that we put the block. It's a big get. The payment from the taxes is a big get. The parking study is necessary for them to do any to have any relief from our fairly onerous parking regulations. And uh, I think we want them to pay attention to what they're doing in terms of parking. And in order to get that relief, they have to do the parking study. The reason why we didn't put the historic district and, and the architectural any design in here is because I don't want to negotiate with them with them. We don't have to. They're not exempt from it under Dover. Therefore, I don't want to negotiate with them, with them about it. Why would we put something on the table that we don't have to negotiate with them? If we want to do design review, we can do it without talking to them about it. And I think they already knew that. It's not no surprise. We can, we can do that. And I'm not going to negotiate that away in order to get something that that we might, you know, why, do, why would we do that? So I think we do need to do, and I've said it a couple times now, design review, and I think we need to beef up the design review in the historic district especially. But we don't have to negotiate with them to do that. Now, uh, finally, I don't, I think that we're losing, well, somebody pointed out that Smith uh, can, it compares itself to Am Amherst and Mount Holyoke, and these are not fair comparisons. These are not fair comparisons, etc. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm not going to have that argument. They do have a small footprint, and I don't want it to get much bigger. They've already bought property on the Green Street side of the campus. If, it, if they don't go up and they need to expand, they're going to go out. We gave them up the height in order to try to keep them within their framework. I would love for them to say, this is the limit of their development, but I'm hearing and say here is it is the limit of the development for the next 30 years. I'd rather they do that than to spread out further into the neighborhood. Could I make one quick response? Yeah. In the ad hoc committee, in response from Smith relating to payment in lieu of taxes, Smith stated that they fully expect Bedford Terrace development to provide it addition. It's, no, it says it, it says won't, it won't offset the loss. It says, but that's what Smith said. Right. It'll be a partial. It'll, it's not a full. That we're going to get right. cash. They're not yeah. going to net out that. That development is not going to net out even to what they've taken off the tax roll. Oh, okay. the agreement is that they're going to pay us the net loss. That's what it says in the development. And the development on Bedford Terrace is not going to net out the loss of those other properties. I'll get you Smith's quote on it. I have the quote, I have the, I have the ad hoc thing right here. And they do say that it's going to be the net, and they agree to the net. Okay, another question? Yeah, hi. Yeah, my name is Peter Whitney. I think some of you know me. I uh, have uh, owned a house on Dry Green for 12 years. I've lived in town for 25 years. I'm, I think, very appreciative of Smith. Both of our <coughs> children went all the way through the Smith College Campus School. I'm a member of the Smith Art Museum, and I, I, I think I agree with the general tenor of the, a lot of the concerns I've heard here tonight. Um, since I, my time is limited, I would maybe like to focus back on one thing that we've heard about already, and that is this height limit. I think that this is a serious mistake for Smith to be even thinking about going to 80 or 85 feet, and uh, I would just call your attention. I walked through Smith coming over here tonight, and I, as I have thousands of times before, and if you look at the two modern, what I consider the big modern architecture projects on campus, uh, alluding to uh, something the mayor mentioned earlier, one of them I think is a big success, the Smith Art Museum, 
Well, I know some of the Elm Street people are not happy with it sitting in the historic district, but I think it's a great uh, piece of architecture. I belong to it. I would encourage any of you that haven't been up to the third floor to see this gallery to go. Um, and I think it works, whereas I think the union does not work. And I think Smith probably tried very hard to get both of them right. And I think this is one of the things about modern architecture. One can't always be sure, even though you hire the best architects and you put the best work into it, that it's going to turn out well. And if you have the thing popping out at 85 feet in our town, it is going to be one white elephant up there. If it looks, any, <laughs> if it looks anything like that union. And I, I, you know, I'm not discrediting the process. I'm sure Smith tried very hard to get that thing to look right. I, I think part of the reason the, the art museum works is because it's low. It's 20 or 30 feet while we're in the top of the church next door to it. It's in scale with the neighborhood. I think that engineering building is not going to work, but at least maybe you can't see it from miles away. I think if you build one of the 85 foot towers, you are going to have a problem. You know, Harvard has that IMPE 17 story psychology building, you know, world famous architect. It's ugly. <laughs> and it's out of scale, and it does not fit on the Harvard campus. And I'll bet they pay a lot of money to erase it from there now, but it's there from four years ago. And I just encourage you to think that I, I, I'm worried that Smith is going to sort of harden against the town and say, well, by golly, we're going to build 85 feet to hell And then what are they going to get? Are you following me? Can I respond Well, no, I think I was more a statement than So I think actually I want to kind of connect with the two, the two previous questions in some ways because um, uh, it, whether or not an 85 foot building is appropriate in North Hampton is a really important question to ask. And uh, uh, I agree with the mayor that you know they're, they're, you know, want to allow, allow Smith to expand and you know, not go out so far. But I think there's other ways that we need to think about that other than, than just height. And, and one is uh, talking about mixed use buildings or something that begins to kind of integrate to the neighborhood. And one thing that hasn't really been addressed in the overlay district and I think has a lot of potential is what is the edge of the campus like and the possibility of perhaps mixed use that would have some residential uses, uses perhaps some commercial uses. The Goody Glancy uh, presentation actually showed buildings like that that exist. So if we begin to look at that edge as really a place where town and town can come together and you know go through a process that the Joel has discussed and John has suggested here, is there a way to deal with that without creating an 85 foot building? Because it's a true condition, right? It's got a very tight area of work. How can we work creatively to kind of create that? And then just to, to go back to Bob's point about being inclusive in the process, I think that parking actually plays a large role in the bulk of these buildings. I mean, it's, it's one of those unsaid things. The, the, the engineering building pretty much goes out, maxes out on the site. And the, the site setbacks, it actually it meets the site setback. But one of the things it doesn't do, that building, if it was built by a normal developer, would require approximately 200 parking spaces. Now, of course, it doesn't need it. You know, Smith doesn't need 300 park spaces right there. They need additional parking. But then there's some sort of arcane calculation that Smith does for parking, but I'm not sure how to do that, that work. But one of the things that if, if the parking was provided there, the building would have a smaller footprint. Right? So that's one thing. Where, so I think the integration of the parking to the campus plan and kind of really working that out with height and uh, would be an important part of it. Could you say that again? If the parking was there, the footprint would be less? Yeah, but you would still but you still have the program needs that they argue in there so the building is the same size and, and then the parking <coughs> stocks that on a campus buildings. you would just right you would append more land to it. The but site, if, if the site the actual park the size required parking based on standard zoning and the building has to be you have to have that trade off. Mm -hmm. that, and also what, what I'm saying, or, or which would you buy more property, right. 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 which would cost the college. So that's what I don't want them to do. If there's right. a creative right. way right. of thinking about that, that, that edge condition, then it could be something where there's uses that are incorporated. That's what I'm saying. There's you know, all these things, and it's about a creating a balance. So we have to go through this process of looking at the parking, looking at the bulk, looking at the height in a holistic way to really see how it can all work out. And, and see if that can arrive at something but that's... I'm still confused, and I, I'm sorry, I know, I'm still confused. If we had said that the, the 
the parking had to be right on site there, those 300 spaces. So they would have had to go up higher than the current height that you're not comfortable with. Well, no, I mean, I think... That's what I'm not understanding. Okay, the, the, because I can't... Right now, they're arguing with the government that it's weak. The height of the building they have is weak. Right. They cannot go up on it. Even under Dover, then they would be able to kind of so say that. So then they would have to spread out to deal with the parking. That's what I, I don't understand. And what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that if there is some way in spreading out that you're incorporating the excuses, you begin to have a more complex edge condition around the campus. But you still have to provide that parking. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, at some point you have to have flat ground with stripes on it. <laughs> And, and, you know, but, 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 but you, you have to have flat land with Not if we do a parking study and negotiate transportation demand management with them, which we required in the development. And all we're up to is that it happens simultaneously. Which and is, then you can really see what the impacts are. Well, we're going to be doing it. Yeah. Simultaneously. Can I say something before we move on? I think that both Bob and Peter were partially right addressing the issue of assessing what is reasonable and what is needed. And one of Sacred's primary concerns with Smith's Smith plan is that they have not um, really supplied a clear formula for how they decided what they needed. For instance, the college says that they need 46,000 square feet in addition to what they need for the engineering building. Building A, which is the one that's been approved, is 140,000 square feet. It seems to me that if you allot 100,000 for engineering, you have enough to cover the distance. And yet there are still 360,000 square feet of science buildings in the books to be planned. And we sort of take issue with the assessment of this need, which is the way that they say they went about doing it was by comparing Smith to quote unquote peer institutions. But we haven't seen a list. Is it Yale? Because that's not an accurate, you know, comparison. Nope. Is it Amherst? <laughs> but we, we would like to know, and I would like to ask that the college be more transparent about its process, because if they did it in a way that actually is reasonable, I think that the members of the community would rest more easily if we felt that the college truly needed 85 foot tall buildings or 65 foot tall buildings, and if they really needed three of them. Now tonight, um, Constantine said three to four additional buildings. I think we want to know how are they choosing to, to come up with what is reasonable and what is needed. We don't know. Um, let's see, I said three to four just because <coughs> it could be three buildings that are the size of the ones that's there, but given the reaction, if it could be four and broken up a little, I just was allowing for that. So that just came from me. Don't need to start new rumors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I think I got the floor. <laughs> Hold it for a second. I want to speak about process and about transparency too, but um, I, I have a bone to pick with um, sacred, yes. and we can't. If, if I want to discuss with you how to respond to Smith, or we can, I email Daryl and his group. Why would you do that? Because that's what I've got for an email, and I don't see your email address on there or your website on there. You're welcome to have it, and we should do it after the meeting. I'd be happy to give you our FAQ and Thank all you. information. We have public meetings, which we've advertised. I haven't, I haven't seen that. that. I'm sorry that you haven't okay. seen that. Because here, I'm moving right in the middle of this. And I'm not sure about right this. now is the best time to talk to us about We're that. We're talking concern. about process. Time. Process is changing. And you need to be in touch with the people who are trying to respond as much as you are to the people who are responding to. I want to speak to you too. This morning I heard Richard Sennett, who's an American, uh, he's written a book called The Culture of the New Capitalism. And he says that there's 8 to 10% right now who are, like me, it's the response to the organization man, but it's an over response. And we're in no way being re replaced by what the town of Smith has proposed. And I've asked him to specify exactly who we are. Because if Smith won't help us organize over where we're going to go, well, I guess we're going to have to do it ourselves. And we're going to have to go buy a neighborhood and, or get our landlords to go there. I mean, seriously, you know, I'm, I'm about 60, and I've got to do this fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I feel like global warming, like the state of Maine, I'm losing a, about a, a foot a year. And, and what exactly do we want? I tried to build up on hospital before we asked Smith to, and I found out 
people have already spoken for it and not the kind of thing that I have in mind. These are small built businesses, nimble. You want to be a tenant. And the responses of tenants to what's coming up is very different from the response of landowners who are interested in property value and things like that. People that I talk to are often say, I'm not going to be there in 10 years. You know, I'm going to buy a house. I'm building a business. I don't have time for that. This isn't my problem. So I say, well, you're stakeholders. I represent who comes after me, and who comes after me, and who comes after me. And we, we need, in order to run our businesses, we need to have savings. We, we would rather be supporting than supportive. We don't want to have to pay 30%. I pay 10% of my, of my income on rent. And it may, has made possible things that would not be possible otherwise. And I want a chance to talk to the people who are also <coughs> concerned about this. Last I heard from Ken, they said, we don't want to talk about exactly who we are. I think that's what we've got to start. Okay, we are. We are. It is almost quarter to nine, and I would like to kind of sum up some of the comments that have been made here tonight. So let's see, a few more people for possibly. Um, I live on I Michael Bevis Valley, and then I can and I just have a couple of questions. Could you speak up, please? I live on Kensington Avenue. My question is about Green Street. And I don't think that would be covered by the Dover Amendment, but at the Charette also, there seems to be a lot of people who want to save Green Street. And I don't know why the city would have to give over Green Street as part of this process. The point was all of Green Street, the college purchased all of the property on both sides and developed both property on both sides. And it's now a college, if and when it gets that point. I think the city, why would the city want to continue responsibility for that road? Just like we gave, uh, gave the college responsibility for Paradise Road when the college and everything was. Well, one thing is that if we kept Green Street as a city street, it would develop more as part of the city. I don't think that's necessarily true. But well, I think it's, it's more likely to happen that if we just planned that it was going to be eliminated, then it would become the city design, the building would be designed more as campus. Well, I, mean, I guess this is a different. This is where the theory and my point of view may differ. I, I'm interested in that Smith develop within the boundary that is created, and and I don't want to set up a, an artificial circumstance where they have to develop where where it restrains that development within the envelope that we've given. Them. So it's just a difference of opinion, and I, I'd rather see them do that interface on the streets that face outside, and that's why we put the design guidelines relative to West Street, especially, uh, on, on in, the, in the agreement. Yeah, I appreciate that. Okay. And another question is, regarding the parking study, I live in Kansas also, and uh, I haven't heard anything about the parking study, so I was just wondering if it would be an opportunity for residents to yeah, I think it would be. participate in the study. City and College agree that when the college completes a parking master plan in cooperation with the city, and that means we're going to involve everybody in it. But now, but now it's being done. It's not being done yet. Okay. Yeah, it says, the city and college agree that when the college completes a parking master, parking master plan in cooperation with the city, and the parties mutually agree on reaching agreement on how many parking spaces are needed to, prove to meet all college needs. Blah, blah, blah. I thought it already started. No. And then my last question was, very quick. and I am an architect, and I'm very aware of aesthetics, I hear a lot of people talking about the size of the building, what they look like. I'm also a father of two little children. I'm very concerned about safety. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I think of bulk and big buildings, I not only think about what they look like, but I think about all the trucks and all the services that come to these buildings. And especially when you eliminate Green Street, that means that these truck buildings have to be pushed even more into the periphery of the campus, which is where we live. That's a very good point. We're, there's a difference between eliminating a road that goes into the campus at that space and, and it being Green Street, a city street. I, I think the college is going to continue a road into the campus. Well, we have a, a language in here relative to, uh, to um, a particular uh, attention to neighborhood campus interface, porous facade, blah, 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 sensitive siding and design of backsides of buildings, dumpsters, water wells, mechanicals, etc. We, we, it's part of what we're talking about. Yeah, I guess I would just propose that uh, the master plan or some uh, preview of what mm -hmm. they really are doing on Green Street uh, to share that with us now and yeah. later. It says the college mm -hmm. um, would need to do a comprehensive circulation and traffic study for the Green and West Street area precinct prior to petitioning for discontinuance of Green Street or Belmont. Yeah. 
So, right, right. I, so I just remember like where it was. <laughs> And it'll be located at the city street. It yeah, might still be an internal <coughs> campus site. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but, but there will be some of the plans that took us from the expansion area. We showed the street completely when they were in space and space. That's right. yeah. That's right. But, but they have to do a traffic. But before the, the cities were we have a discussion about the discontinuance, there would be a, they have to do a full traffic and circulation. It's really hard to pause to buy a garbage truck, you know, if you want to go across the street. So they may do. I think about it. I, I guess, I think, I think you think about no, that's yeah. a fair concern, yeah. and that's part of the reason why we put the traffic circulation study in. But they don't have to do that unless they petition for closing the street? They have to do it every time they do a site plan approval. Parking study. No, no, the parking circulation. study they have to do if they want any relief from the 300 spaces that Joseph is just Okay, we have two more questions. Oh, possibly one. Just one question. Well, Does the mayor open meeting? Have a meeting with the board of trustees? No, I've met them once. No, I've never met them. I think that partly answers your question. The town has open meetings and discusses the board of trustees flies in from many locations and approves the building. I, it, I don't know even if they saw the size of that building that Joseph imposed upon it. We have a view where we incorporate Smith mm -hmm. with the town and the city as a whole. Smith, particularly the trustees, and the city of Smith. I think that goes on with any town in the It goes on with any town and gown relationship. Quite frankly, it goes on with any town and private entity or a relationship. We're required under law to have public meetings and people get to see what's going on. And I think that's a good thing. If I could require Smith to televise the board trustee meeting, believe me, I would do it. <laughs> but we do bring pictures to the site plan approval. <laughs> I want to talk about that too. I want to talk about that too. Um, that's something that uh, I've been watching as, as I've been, you know, like this observer <laughs> to the Smith development. Uh, I think in many ways the public thinks that uh, somehow Smith should be held to the standards of a public entity. But in fact, Smith is private. Uh, it's a not-for-profit organization at the same time, so it can operate in a way that's really hidden from the public's purview. And that's something that, you know, I think it's taken a lot of people to get used to, you know, the fact that you know, Smith does not have to open up its meetings, it does not have to participate in, a, in an open fashion uh, as, uh, say, a, a UMass would, would have to do. And that, I think, that, you know, is back to John's question, that is one of those roadblocks. You know, that's one of those barriers that you uh, were asking about earlier. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, my name is Emily Powers, Smith College, class of 2003. Um, I have many points. I'll try to keep it short. Um, first, a few things that I think are worthy to be pointed out. The first one is about the um, Egyptian Paradise Division. Um, and I would just like to let everyone be aware of uh, the first stereotype on campus with the pod is what they're spelled with. Um, and uh, I, I, don't in, I don't live in the pod. I live in an area of campus um, that has seen this recent development. Um, and it's that development that gets comes out of college housing. It's actually in the style of the buildings in the area that matches the campus school and the house, house, house. Um, And it seems to me that it has some facilities that it can use. Um, Line of 200 people at dinner called, I think, the more dining facilities as an easy example. My point is that in the area of campus where I live, not where the rich girls live, um, <laughs> these building facilities uh, have, have taken place, um, and they are in the style of uh, the surrounding buildings. It just seems to me that with Smith not thinking about developing areas in the squad, um, regardless of whether this building can match uh, the surrounding architecture, seems to me to put in with a sort of uh, policy of Smith to, to keep the quad not only um, in, in the style that it's in, but to keep uh, the, um, to, to remain sensitive, I'll use their language, to remain sensitive to, to the differences across campus. That's not just uh, the stylistic differences, but I would say the economic point. And it seems that this um, provision sort of comes into the thought also, um, concentrating an area of privilege around the quad, uh, the second thing I think is worthy to be pointed out 
um, is that we heard about uh, this development agreement and expansion over the next 30 years. Um, I would like to point out uh, that in some of the literature that Smith has used to justify its need for science expansion, it's pointing to buildings that are 20 and 30 years old as no longer meeting the college's needs. Those buildings are, in my terms, obsolete. So over the next 30 years, Smith continues to uh, build. By the time that building project is done, those buildings will be 30 years old, and according to Smith's logic, obsolete, which it seems to me will call for more building. Um, and then I just have a few questions, and they mostly have to do with semantics, language use, and who gets to make which definition. Um, the development agreement talks about notice that is complete and timely. What is complete and timely, and who gets to decide? If one party has information that it considers complete and gets that information to the other party, that's the information the other party has, how do they know whether it's complete? Um, I would like to see some agreement about what complete information is, because in my experience, the information Smith gives to students and alumni is not complete. Um, I would also like to know, uh, the college has to prove its need. Um, I would like to know what proof that is, because again, in that literature that I referred to, it seems that what it's saying and the reasons for its need, for example, that Bath Hall is 20 years old, is an exaggeration. Granted, yeah, a slight one, but um, an exaggeration nonetheless, according to Smith's own information, which is in the display case of Bath Hall. Um, and finally, what is educational use? Um, and this is something that seems to me probably to have been left deliberately ambiguous, but there would be flexibility. But I want to know, would a parking structure be considered an educational use? And maybe you want a gigantic parking structure given the situation. Under state but law, that it would be is. considered okay. an educational use. That's why they ended up with one on West Street. Okay. Um, and oh, one more thing that I forgot to point out. We talked about a demolition and considering uh, what happens when buildings are demolished and so forth. I'd also like to bring up upkeep and maintenance. Um, it seems to me that it's in Smith's best interest to seriously consider how it is going to maintain whatever buildings will be built um, within the EUO. Because I can tell you, my house, parts of it have been condemned. There are buildings where the paint is peeling. And I wonder if it's in the community and the college's best interest to be allowing for big, big buildings that potentially would not be maintained to an acceptable standard. I always thought when I was younger that the quad was where the good parties were. So I've always heard parties, so I've never heard rich. Oh, they have money to throw the parties. Oh, parties are cost prohibitive. It's a whole different, it's a whole different ballgame. Okay, we had, I see that there were two, I know there were two hands back there before. Because we, we are six minutes to nine now, and I would really like to just do a quick sum up. So, very, very quickly. Okay. Well, it's not so much a question, maybe as a comment, that I'm very struck by how this issue of what are the barriers doesn't get answered, really. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, you cannot buy a feeling, do you know? And so Smith is offering to relocate people. They're offering to do this and that. But essentially, you're changing the character of this town and, and the way it looks. And that is sort of... You can't put a price on that. So then I wonder when, Claire, when you say that you have two options, you can go out or up, but the option of the state hospital is still sitting there. And, and I just guess I can't understand why Smith goes forward into this sort of battle, because it's so clear to me that there is this great resistance to this for very good reason, including the demolition of the houses and so forth sort of breaks your heart. And so I guess I want to know, because I'm not really part of these ongoing discussions, but why isn't the state hospital on the plate still, on the table? Um, because of distance. And I know that it's next door, um, but it's next door quite a walk uh, from the, the academic center of the campus. Um, perceptual distance is even greater, of course, because it's up uh, a, a hill if you did walk across, out across the athletic fields and then and then up the hill. Um, campuses like Smith, small liberal arts colleges, uh, or large liberal arts colleges, I should say, um, which are, are small academic institutions, are usually a single campus. They're not usually broken up um, into a kind of a two-campus um, area. 
And so it's definitely distance for us. The college obviously has a large number of buildings across Green Street already. Um, our entire athletic complex, the, the entire uh, theater or performing arts complex. Um, somebody mentioned earlier, um, we have a, an administrative um, office building, a faculty office building on Belmont. So this is an area uh, into which the college has grown for decades. Um, and so it was a natural area for us to look for additional growth. Um, in the past, probably that happened one building at a time. Um, something that's quite different this time is that we put future plans out on the table for discussion. And that's brought a lot of this comment and concern uh, because it's a whole um, longer term vision of the growth in that area rather than continuing the one building at a time. But it is clearly an area um, into which the college has grown over a, a many, many, many years. Um, I have a question, and this is, um, again, looking at the Kensington Avenue neighborhood. I live at the other end from Joel, the Dryad's Green End, and there are those beautiful faculty houses across the street from where I live. There are six of them on that row, and currently three are empty. And so I'm, of course, concerned with what the college's plans are for these houses, because it seems that having lived in this area for five years now, all the old, the long-term faculty who lived there for 20, 30 years have moved out. Young faculty can't afford the rents in those houses. So these houses are standing empty, some of them for more than a single year. Um, and so it concerns me that these houses are empty. They're beautiful houses. It concerns me, we, we've been talking about height requirements. We haven't talked really about length requirements. But we're also talking about that parking study, and I'm just wondering whether if this educational use overlay comes into play, would there be a situation where all that area, or the Dryad's Green, the green part area of Dryad's Green, could be knocked down and turned into a parking lot? And are we abdicating um, city um, ability to argue about that by giving this educational use overlay? Would we still have safeguards against a parking lot going into that area? or those houses being knocked down. We don't have safety on that We do expect to put more parking in that area. Those houses will remain where they are. Um, why are they empty? Well, um, it's kind of across the city probably, but um, a number of people moved out and were able to buy their own homes when um, mortgage rates were really low and banks were willing to loan, you know, 95 plus percent uh, so that people could get into their own homes. We hope to have tenants back in them um, for the fall. But there's no currently any plan to, I believe in the past there was a plan to put a parking lot in the Dryad's Green neighborhood. Is that plan yes, going to we come do back? to add parking in that area. Yes, the Campus Planning Committee has already spoken. Mm -hmm. But, but I wanted to say something. But it's nothing new. It's not It's not related Whether to Whether or not we had this overlay, right. they could still do parts. Well, why don't the neighbors, why don't the neighbors There was a meeting with the neighbors a few years ago, but we'll probably have another. But the plan is already <laughs> made. <laughs> 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 then you will inform the neighbors. That's it. One more comment. I'm real, real, so very quick.
company also had options for detailing within that. Design review came up under different, uh, in different ways um, from all sides as a way of doing that. Uh, let's see, the scale of Green Street, the whole issue of Green Street and when that becomes part of the uh, campus. Um, pedestrian safety, um, traffic circulation safety around that whole Green Street. Uh, the issue of the parking study um, involving everybody in that, keeping transparency in that whole process. And then, um, of course, there was a request for transparency oh, uh, with the trustees, but um, I'm that come out of the trustees. Well, I think you did miss my interested in the height of the building. Oh, the, well, of course, the big, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the big points, which I was going to um, tie in. Um, what we came around here originally about was in response to, as my understanding, I have to also say, again, I'm an outsider, um, and I purposefully tried to stay out of the details of this discussion because I, I, um, I'm, I'm trying to remain objective. So I have a little bit more history now after tonight. I want to thank you all for that. But one of the big reasons that this process happened tonight was because of the um, discussion around the height variance. Correct. And, uh, or, well, this, John, maybe you can put it in here. But there was a planning board. The planning board meeting on Thursday to discuss the, the overlay district. Oh, they'll be there. Okay, so, well, the height the height's height been a big part of the, the height allowance. Okay, right. so I'm, I'm still misunderstanding. But height, height is a big issue on that. And there w there has been something, I guess there was a question, it wasn't formed directly like this, but I understood there was in people's minds, well, if we didn't go up and we went out in a more intertwined way, um, is that an option to bring back to the table and talk about it? You know, that, I see Joseph shaking his head, but that was no, sort of that. underlined yeah. a little bit in some of the comments. But I guess the height is a concern, the scale, there's a little bit of, a, of an addressing of that issue around the setbacks, and I guess that's still people need more information about that. And, and more discussion, and, and maybe this group needs to come back together again. There were multiple requests for greater transparency yes. in the process. And, and, and maybe as part of that, this, this question of road drops, I think was an interesting one, kind of like the first time it's kind of come up in a way. I mean, I think it's always been there, but I haven't really openly talked about it. And I'm not sure if we properly addressed it tonight, so I think it's something that we can begin to talk about. What are the roadblocks? Right. I, I, have the I guess I have to disagree. I think Smith very clearly said they're willing to talk to us, but they're not going to give up their rights. You know, on a certain point. I think that's part of the dilemma here that we have as a community, with all due respect to them. Mm -hmm. They have said that if they're going to go so far and no further, that's the roadblock. So what do we do within that context, within the struggle that we on the city side have had? And I, I think that's the dilemma. So we're offering a, an answer. If the community chooses through the democratic process now not to take that as the answer, we'll be back at the table with Smith. I have to say, quite frankly, because they don't need another permit, because the engineering building has been permitted, we will not now have the discussion for another X number of years. And in, in that interim period, the issues that we've negotiated will be set aside. I'm just saying. It's worth noting, though, that when John asked the specific question, where are the roadblocks, Mayor Higgins actually provided the answer and the constituency nodded. But yep. we don't, we don't no, she it. said that. No, I spoke about it earlier. I addressed it directly when John asked about it. You, you gave one was. initial answer, and then just rephrased, and John said yes. Where, and I responded question. again. No, actually, it was Mayor Higgins. Did anyone else? No, I answered first. And then you moved on. I um I would like to just well first of all thank everybody for having this discussion. But I think what what a lot of this comes down to is that the community is asking Smith to do something that is most institutions are reluctant to do, whether they're corporations or colleges or or a hospital, um, which is we're asking we're asking our neighbor Smith to not just do what they have to do legally, not just see their legal responsibility, but look at some ethical and moral responsibility for the community. And not just sit on, on uh, say we have the right to do this, but ask the question, well, what are our responsibilities to our host community and that we're in a partnership with? 
Uh, what are the things we don't have to do, but that if we do them, we'll make this a better place? And I, I, that ties back to the whole sustainability initiative that the mayor has put forward um, to make, it, it, Smith doesn't have to be sustainable, but it would be a very wonderful thing for them to do that. I just, I, I the development agreement is full of those things. I, 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 we did go to them and ask them to do certain things that they've done, and they didn't do everything that we put on the table. They've done some of them. Do I wish they had done a lot more? Yeah. But we got as far as we got. But Again, you're, you're it's within the... Them. You're, you're the first not one defend, I'm just putting... Them and standing in the way of furthering the dialogue. If, 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 the, if the planning board and the city council don't pass, they will be back at the table. But as I said, our leverage on a number of these issues was that first permit. That first permit has been issued. Therefore, we will have not have another discussion about this until the next permit comes up. Yeah. Unless they want to. I also want to throw something in. Just having gone through now three FDEP processes around the country, in Massachusetts and outside, I think you talk about sustainability. It's a, it's a two-way street. If you look at Smith within the city and the city fabric, it's in a location it is. If it were Cooley Dickinson here and those two places reversed, the discussions would be, could have a different flavor. But you have to... Cooley have, Dickinson has an entire community. It's a public... But Smith does too, public in a way, the law. and public. in a way. Okay. The law. Well, no, but you have, you have to. You have to. You have you to. Can, you can look at direct impact, and you can look at indirect impact. But the fact remains that Northampton is defined by Smith, just no. as Smith no. is defined. No, it's mine. And it's okay. Can I? Can I talk now? I just want to finish <laughs> off saying thank you. I've let everybody talk, and usually I'm the one who never shuts up. But now I'd like a minute. So. Smith is defined by Northampton just as Northampton is defined by Smith. And if you look at the, and I'm, and I'm trying to be objective here, but if you look at the whole city in the big picture, and this is what the FDEP is trying to do, and this is what the ongoing process is trying to do, you, you have to stop and do that. You have to look at, look at it from both sides. That's all I'm, I'm saying. And, and how the city defines itself as, I mean, when you come through downtown, you see, and you go up Elm Street, what do you see is, is Smith campus right there in the center, in the heart of the city, the gateway into that campus is right there. And that has defined people's perception of Smith. Just as students come here, make their decision to come here, and, and Smith is defined by what Northampton is. So I, I'm just pointing that, and I'm not, I'm not trying to take sides, I'm just saying you have to look at it from both sides. That's all. I wonder if you might offer us two or three next steps, and then we put all this energy into two hours. Well, I think it, I think it would be good to sum up some of these things and get them out to the rest of the community. And I don't know if this discussion wants to continue, but you know, after a while, you can talk to them too. I would leave that. I'm I'm just a moderator here. I would leave that to everybody on the outside. But I think what some other institutions have done, and there's a beginning attempt here, um, design design guidelines is what. to add a little bit more depth to what this black or this gray zone looks like. And you, you addressed that in, in some of the, the ways you look at the different parts of campus and the scale and the different uses you see in there. And that's something that you could address. I know Penn, University of Pennsylvania, had finally done that. They also went through a very, very painful expansion process in Philadelphia buying a property, leveling it, putting up parking, just sitting there for years just blacktop and, and taking a lot of affordable housing and not getting anything back. And then, um, and very, very painful for the whole city, actually. And then finally came around to a different process. But one thing that they did put together was a set of design guidelines, which addresses a lot of the things that everybody's been talking about. But it's, it was a way of putting it on the table and everybody agreeing that this is important. I'm trying to summarize what I think we have to do. Okay, we have a process that we're in the middle of. We're not at the beginning of the process. We're actually in the middle. There's a zoning ordinance that's on the table for the third day of the planning board. There'll be discussion at the planning board. There's an amended ordinance. It sounds like the planning department needs to come back with some, if we may have to have a discussion with Smith about the issue of, of Elm Street, because that came up. And I think that's a discussion you may want to have. I don't know whether Smith is open to that or not, but that's a discussion. 
Secondly, design guidelines, I think, are imperative to be talked about, and they need to be talked about at the both the historic district level, and then there needs to be a discussion at the planning board and council level around the central business architecture district as it relates to Western. Okay. The um, third issue is this parking issue. There's two pieces to the parking issue. There's an immediate parking issue that I think the Kensington mayors are rightly identifying that they feel out of the loop relative to a discussion that Smith is having. I'm going to strongly suggest that Smith have a conversation with them. It sounds like they're going to do that, but they should do that. The second and bigger question is the question of identifying parking needs campus-wide, which is in the development agreement. Assuming the development agreement goes forward, there will be a full-fledged discussion about camp uh, uh, ongoing campus <coughs> parking needs. Okay, those are two, a couple, I think, of tangible things that need to be done <coughs> right away, or, or in, the, in the near term. If, the, for any reason, the overlay district fails, and it could, I think we're going to be sort of in a hiatus for a while. I'm going to be back talking to Smith about whether, what parts of the development agreement they're willing to stick to. The one, only one that they've said they're willing to because the trustees have said they were is to replicate the housing. I don't have a commitment for 99 years of affordability, and I don't have a commitment on the taxes, so I'm concerned about that. I think it just feels like it's a power play like any developer who would say, we want this, we have this, we own this, and we're pushing and we're pushing. And there are many suggestions here about the character. The title of this, this session was very nice, about the edge of the community that we don't feel heard about. Mm -hmm. And I doubt whether and it's going to be dealt with on Thursday night. I think it can be dealt with in, through, the, through the issue of design. But I, I understand that people don't agree with that, but I do think it can be dealt with. And I, and I think we would have had a different campus center if we had had design guidelines. Well, is, is the height regulation part of what you're thinking no, about? No, it wouldn't be. But the set, but I, I think, um, yeah. this is a lot, we have to go another two yeah. hours, but I'm happy to sit down and talk to you about it. <laughs> That's a fair point, and, and yeah. uh, uh, it's in it's in another part of the zoning ordinance yeah. which doesn't show but, up there. So, but it's it not needs to be a, this is part of transparency. It needs to be available to the public. That's a fair point. Very fair point. Very fair point. Very fair point. Okay, if I can just extend that a little bit, is that we, we've gone through a lot of planning guidelines. But I have to say, we're kind of planning guidelines out. <laughs> because what happens is the way the guidelines are applied, you know, and that. Because the Smith building meets all the planning guidelines that were developed and the working group, right, that are being you know, touted as the thing that's going to guide the rest of this development. Well, you see the results of the planning guidelines in action. And I think that's the problem. I think what we really need is some concrete planning, right, like, kind of, like look, where are the parking lots? Where are the buildings, the new buildings going to be? And this is not designing them, this is planning. So it's like location, height, this is done all the time. Uh, you know, you know, <coughs> offices, we really begin to kind of look and see in, in three-dimensional ways. I mean, Amherst is going through this process right now, and it's getting a very sophisticated computer program to oh, look at the three-dimensional you know, model of the of, city. Of, of the, not of the college. Of the city, the college is part of the city. Well, but they're not, re are they Amherst requiring the Amherst the College and New Hampshire College to share their campus plan? I don't know. That's the issue. With all due respect, I hear what you're saying. No, but I'm, I'm more That's talking about issue. maybe, you know, the fact. I mean, there's, there's a lot of bad examples out there. So, I mean, I think we need but, to but you brought up Amherst as a good no. example. So. <laughs> we, we've got the worst reputation in the state. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not 
But I think, I mean, the, the, I mean, my main point is that we have to be moving on to design guidelines and really looking at which is, which is why we put that they need to share information with you. Absolutely. But I think that needs to happen before something like the well, but I'm not sure that I can add. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming, and especially spur of the moment participation from their opinions. Well, I was hoping to I really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody else and to Daryl for organizing this. Thank you, Daryl.